<clears throat> Good morning, everyone. Just want to thank you um, for joining us today. Um, we are the Minnesota State Indigenous Men and Men of Color Work Group. Um, our mission is to ensure the success of Indigenous men and men of color within the Minnesota State colleges and university. This includes both students and employees. Our vision statement is to provide holistic and institutional support to enhance the academic professional success of indigenous men and men of color enrolled and employed with, within the men's state system. Um, one of our main values is equity and inclusion. We want to engage in continuous reflection collaboration to increase our capacity to address disparities within the higher education system and to weave our cultural perspectives into the Minnesota state system as a whole. Today, you're gonna to hear experiences of your colleagues, teachers, advisors, and mentors of color. To my white colleagues, today is a day to listen to our experiences and not control the narrative. We are here today to share with you our own experiences. We are not sharing our stories for you to feel sorry for us, but rather for you to know the truth and to act to ensure that this does not happen for future generations. You all are the key to equity. The Minnesota State Indigenous Men and Men of Color Work Group is united on our push for racial equity within the Minnesota State system and want to work with all within our system interested in our common goals. To union and campus leaders, I'm talking to you. Can we have a seat at the table? Can we have a voice? Our first speaker is Dr. Luke Tripp. Um, he's a pillar within the African-American community. Dr. Luke Tripp has taught social justice for over 30 years within the Minnesota State System at St. Cloud University. Dr. Tripp is an elder and a former minister of information for the Detroit branch of the Black Panther Party. Dr. Tripp will help us ground us in our work today. Without further ado, Dr. Tripp. Uh, thank you very much for that uh, generous uh, introduction. What I want to do is I ground us in our history so we have a perspective so we can put the murder of George Floyd in perspective. So we understand that why there, his death sparked a huge global explosion in resistance. First, we have to understand the kind of the nature of the society that we live in. This society uh, and how this country came into being. This country has its origin in British colonialism. When this country was sort of uh, established by the colonists in 1607, that it was in the pursuit of a merchant class for wealth, right? And so I want to tie in the wealth story from the beginning because the wealth story plays a very important role in a, to understand the essence of what George Floyd case is all about. So this country was basically created by a wealthy class and it was going to do, any, it would not let anything uh, interfere with its project of creating wealth. Now to create wealth, basically you need natural resources and labor. Well, the natural resource was the land. This land was occupied by our indigenous brothers and sisters. Well, they became a problem for the emerging white elite. And so the object was to take that wealth. The American Indian brothers uh, and sisters resisted, and there was a, this was the beginning of the genocidal war. Right? The other, uh, to create wealth, you need labor. There was indeed was poor white labor, but one of the most uh, the cheapest labor, and the labor that could best be controlled was slave labor. So the role of we as African people was to play the role of providing labor for the economic development of that wealthy class. Here we are in 2020 in the gap between the wealthy class, the super wealthy and the rest is increasingly growing. Now to maintain, so the social structure that came into being was a stratified society. It became stratified along racial and class lines. And this, uh, when uh, the George Washington and, and company 
George Washington was perhaps the biggest slave owner in America. Thomas Jefferson was also part of that elite. And their idea was to build a nation controlled by a white ruling elite. And when you're establishing a hierarchy along class and racial, racial lines, you have to have a control mechanism to keep everybody in place in their rank order. So the, mecha, the mechanism of control, the final mechanism of control is one of a military, right? So the role of the military and the role later as we began to see the role of the police, when the police have been blazing on their squad cars to serve and protect, and they're in our neighborhoods, in a native neighborhood, in a brown neighborhood, in a black neighborhood, it's not to serve and protect us in those neighborhoods. It's designed, uh, it, that whole poli uh, police structure is designed to serve the ruling elite, to keep those who may upset the social order, who may cause disruption, that mechanism comes into place to basically uh, deal with the destabilizers. So what you see, the reason, now that police force, right, in 2020, we see that many police, uh, police captains and chiefs are people of color. We see increasing numbers of police officers are, uh, are people of color. And essentially, their role is not to serve the uh, population, poor white people, uh, people of color, uh, native people, is to keep and maintain that kind of order to uh, maintain the order, particularly the order that was set up and designed by the wealthy elite and as they pass it through generations and generations uh, down through uh, the century. So now many times we look for relief by having a more integrated police force, by having more blacks in political office and all of that. Well, that does have some effect, right? But, there, but they, these police, black police, people, uh, police of color and all of that, that system, the, the system that they are become, they play a role in is not designed to, it has nothing to do with justice as we understand justice. When we understand justice, the concepts we use is that of equality, that of fairness, that of providing uh, positive and support, support for uh, the for, for for all the for all those in the society. Well, the and as you see, as uh, some of the storylines from the upheavals and the resistance that we see in the streets today, how the conversation quickly uh, turned towards not basically dealing with the uh, the lives of people, but with the protection for the property. So they get into burning, they get into looting and all of that because that's what their system, those are the values of the ruling elite. They value property. At one time, we black folks were part of their property. We were part of their capital, right? And so we, we get it from, we see it from as consumers in 2020. We also know that we were also the property of those ownership uh, classes. So we have to get this basic understanding. If we don't understand basically the very nature of those criminal justice system, and we have to understand why, although they, the, uh, we have more and more people of color serving in that criminal justice system, we see the pattern is essentially the same because the criminal justice system was, is a control me mechanism, is control these lower class folks, uh, working class people, people of color, and to keep us in line. So I just want us to, uh, I just want to provide us in this sort of uh, context. And what happens is as long as we can begin to talk about individual racist cops, as long as we're talking about um, these uh, cops should, should be better trained and they should go to uh, multicultural diverse workshops and all that, well, that has uh, an effect. But it's not going to find, it's not going to change the fundamental relationship between these communities of colors and the police department, right? And so we just got to get that kind of understanding and that we're part, we have to change the total political structure. We live in a racist capitalist society. And unless we address capitalism at its core, then, uh, and we can see how the system, the things, oh, we're in the midst of a, of, the, of, a, of a pandemic. 
and we can see it situated in terms of what lives are value. We don't have a public health system, for instance. A public health system would look like one that you will find in Sweden or Finland or in Cuba. In other words, they have a system to set up to protect the public. In this, in America, we have a private health system. And that means you get health services based on your ability to pay for it. If you can't pay it, then it's unlikely that you get the, uh, the health services that you are, uh, that's, uh, that's required. And instead of this government, it says, well, the military is there to defend you and to protect lives. Well, we see that in hospitals, many of the healthcare workers, doctors and nurses and all, they're looking for protection uh, equipment. Well, they said they can't, uh, it's not available. But we can see in the streets, they have no problem equipping the police with their tools, like military equipment, high equipment, all of that. Why is it that nurses and doctors can't get protective equipment and all that? Uh, because the system is, uh, uh, and, but the military can get what it needs to destroy life. So those people who are involved in terms of trying to preserve life or trying to uh, support life, uh, we see much of the resources going for those who are in the business of destruction. So at the national level and the global level, America is about being a superpower, nuclear weapons, nuclear submarines, all that kind of civilians. So this country started out as a very violent project by the Europeans, and it continues to be the most violent source of uh, destruction today in 2020. Thank you, Dr. Tripp. All right. We appreciate that so much. Um, for Next is uh, David Isham. For many years, David Isham has been a leader in, in the American Indian community. And as a member of the Minnesota State community, he has been a powerful advocate for indigenous communities. And I'm fortunate to call him my mentor and a friend. David Isham, would you like to uh, lead us in a few words. Anin, David Isham in the Shemikas. I was asked today to offer a prayer and a good way to get, begin this meeting. I did a little research and uh, I am not fluent in my own native language. Uh, so I have to print this out and I, I will be reading it to you. Uh, and I will tell you the meaning after I conclude the prayer itself. Chimanadu, Dada Wiku Kawasan, Wiwenji, Nanan Gada Wandaman, Ji Odapi Man, and you, Igashkito Siwan, Ji Anishidoyan, Ji, Gi Apichi De Ayayan, Ji Anishi Sidoyan, Igashkito Bayan. G di pitcha p ni bawakanyan G ginan doman ono what i stated to you was uh, the serenity prayer i've used this many times in my own guidance it's something i picked up along the way as my brother struggled with uh, some addiction but it's something that i used to uh, help guide me and i simply stated Great Spirit, help me to accept those things I cannot change, the power to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. And I continue to use that even today with the challenges that we are facing, uh, the many challenges we are facing today. And it is a, a good guidance for me, and I hope that it becomes a guidance for some of you amongst the audience as well. Uh, George Floyd, I am George Floyd. I am George Floyd. Good morning, everybody. My name is John Harper. Um, I am the incoming director of diversity, equity, and inclusion at South Central College. Uh, when we began to develop this webinar, I had to sit and think which story to share because there are many and I had to think do I share one that happened recently do I share one that happened previously I literally had to go by month and figure out which story I would share the story that I will share uh, briefly but before I do that I do want to make mention that uh, we have 
a poll, several polls that will be going around and all of you that are actively participating and listening, we do want you to participate in this poll with several questions that we have as it pertains to this webinar. The story I'd like to share with you is at a particular job and at a particular place. I had been at this place for, I wanna say seven or eight months. And one night um, during the week, it was a Tuesday night, I received a loud banging noise on my door. My wife, myself, and um, our four month old daughter uh, who was sleeping at the time, it was 10.30 at night, were all awoken and shocked. So I got up, told my wife, don't worry about it. And I looked through the peephole and it happened to be a gentleman with the North Mankato Police Department. I slowly opened the door, said, good evening, officer. How can I help you? The officer immediately took a step back and put his hand on his gun and proceeded to yell at me, asking me what my first name was, what my last name was, and if I worked at this particular place. I told him, yes, sir, that is my first name and is my last name, and I do work at this particular place. I cannot describe to you the amount of fear and emotion and thoughts that I had that were going through this. As he continued, proceeded to yell, he told me that um, my vehicle was parked and that I needed to move it or it would be towed. The issue was is that my vehicle was parked at my particular place of employment and it had an overnight decal saying that I would pick it up because the transmission was out of it. And as the officer proceeded to berate me and belittle me, the only thing that I could think about is why is his hand on his gun? Why is he threatened by me? And the officer's stature dwarfed mine. He had to be at least 6'3 or 6'4. But in that moment, I thought I might lose my life. I thought about my wife. I thought about my daughter. And my wife had come out and she was terrified. After the officer had completed his tirade and yelling at me, I got on the phone and contacted a, a several people that I needed to contact to let them know what the situation was. And as it turns out, somebody at that particular place um, let's just say did not follow the policy and procedures that were necessary and contacted the local law enforcement and sent them to my house. I am George Floyd. Chong, I'm mute. My name is Chong Moore and I'm an academic advisor at uh, Inver Hills Community College. And I am George Floyd. You know. uh, I can still remember it vividly. You know, uh, my first interactions with the uh, police uh, came other than the um, opportunities for educational programming in the schools came when I was uh, 15 years old. My sister and I had a um, stop in downtown and uh, uh, got off the uh, Metro Transit bus stop, uh, got off the bus, uh, walked the next couple of blocks to the next bus stop, uh, hoping to catch a ride home, you know, making our way back home. And um, a police car pulled up and uh, immediately started questioning me um, about what I was doing and uh, what I had in my pocket. You know, at the time I was standing at the bus stop with my sister and my hands were in my pocket and he uh, immediately said, what are you doing? You know, started questioning me. And I said, waiting for the bus. I'm, uh, I wanna go home. And, uh, and then uh, he continued on saying, what do you have in your pocket? And uh, being the nerd that I was back uh, uh, in uh, high school, I actually had a, uh, big pink eraser in my pocket. And I told him, well, I have an eraser. And he uh, immediately told me to take it out and show it to him. Took it out and it was my big pink eraser. At the time, I didn't think anything of it. I thought, why, why? I just wanna go home, I'm just standing here. Why, why come up and question me threatening like, like that? Um, and then uh, a couple years went by, I got into college and uh, we started learning about social just justice and racial profiling and then it, suddenly realized, um, I suddenly realized and it dawned on me that I was at that incident racially profiled, you know, as a young Asian American Hmong male waiting for the bus in downtown St. Paul, I was racially profiled. And then an event in uh, the summer of 2006 hit me really hard, like a sledgehammer to the head. Um, for, for those who are, who are Hmong, you probably remember, you probably know about this, but uh, 
In the summer of 2006, the Minneapolis Police Department killed Fong Lee. Shot him eight times, four times in the back. Fong Lee and his uh, friends were riding a bike, riding their bikes. And police came up, questioned them, and for some reason, Fong Lee decided to run. And uh, we know what the results are. He's dead. Can't tell his side of the story. Can't tell us why he ran. And when I learned about it, it hit me really hard because at that moment, if that police pulled up, young teenage Hmong male like me, if that police pulled up, questioned me, what was I doing and what I had in my pocket, if I had the uh, experience of uh, you know, being treated differently uh, and uh, had those experience, I would have maybe, I don't know, ran because I felt a danger or something like that, like Fong Lee and I would be like that too, you know, I would be just like Fong Lee. And uh, to, to know that, you know, it happens not only, you know, to, to me, you know, uh, being profiled like that, but it could happen that at any moment I could lose my life just because somebody felt that uh, I was a threat to them by running away, you know. And to also learn that it happens every single day to people I would call my brothers, my coworker, my colleague, and dear friends. It happens every single day. You know? it, it has to stop. It has to stop. Things have to change. You know? It cannot be. We talk about it today and we change tomorrow. It has to start today. And hence why I am George Floyd. Thank you, Tron. Um, <clears throat> I, like Mr. Harper um, previously, was, was trying to wrap my head around which incident um, to, to share with you all today. Um, and I, I will share the, the first time I had a gun pulled on me by a police officer. Um, I was driving home from Minnesota State University, Mankato, um, driving home to Waukesha, Wisconsin, um, in my car with my other teammates in the car. Um, and all of a sudden we see a cop car start to accelerate and get behind us. Um, all of us being from Milwaukee and Waukesha um, had a lot of history with, with police officers already. So we already had that fear and years of trauma. Um, when the police officer came to the car, his gun was pointed um, directly at the driver's side. I'm the driver in the car. His partner hopped out of the car and also pulled the gun on the other two black males that were in the car. I hadn't broken the law. I wasn't speeding. I was being pulled over because I had an expired registration. In the state of Wisconsin, you have to go back to get an update in your license plates registrations. I played football in Minnesota and, and calmly tried to calmly explain to the officer that I was going back home for the first time because my season just ended. Um, and if, if I could explain the, the silence that was in the car for the rest of the three hours that we drove home, we all had a, a, a commonality of knowing this was not our first encounter with police. Um, that's one of the many. Um, it was hard for me to wrap my head around it and and put it into sharing one story. And that was the, the pain that I've been feeling and that I see so much. It, it could easily be me. No, no matter how, what level of education I get. Um, when I got my master's degree, I, I thought it all was subside. I'm, I made it and, I, and getting pulled over, leaving my campus, um, asking me where I'm going. Still, still had not broken any crime or anything like that. So I can be leaving from my own place of employment, still get pulled over, guns drawn, searched. I've never committed a crime. I've never even got a ticket. I've done everything in my power to avoid interactions with law enforcement. It could have been me. I am George Floyd. I am George Floyd. My name is Jared Pigeon, pronouns he, him, and I serve as the campus diversity officer at the Minnesota State University, Moorhead. The last few months have been very challenging for me, particularly witnessing the killing of unarmed black men, Ahmed Aubrey and George Floyd being murdered by white males on the public streets has been very traumatic. These are the same streets that you and I drive on the same streets that our children drive on. And now 
all black men in America are reminded of their blackness and how they can also die in these streets unexpectedly and at the hands of white males with power, not only their firepower, but also their whiteness power. I would like us to recall an incident in which a black male's race was being weaponized against him just recently. Last week, Memorial Day in a New York City park, Amy Cooper, a white female, was allowing her dog to be off of its leash. Grassing through the trees in an area where park rules clearly state that this is against the rules, which is understood by all park goers. Christian Cooper, no relation, was out bird watching that day and came through the trees and kindly asked Amy to leash her dog because of the disturbance that the dog makes uh, when it brushes through the trees and startles the birds and they fly away. In addition, he also added that it was against park rules. What proceeded next was caught on camera. It showed Amy under no apparent danger telling, that, telling the man that he was harassing her and that she was calling the cops. While she is on the phone, she is seen dramatizing being under attack as she repeats, I am being attacked by a black man in the park to the dispatch agent who could not understand what she was saying. So she yells it a third time and communicated it with a tone in which would echo immediate danger while saying that she and her dog were in danger. I want each of us to think about a couple things with this incident. One, how keenly she was aware that if she said she was under attack by a black man, how this would be trigger words that would heighten the racial undertones for the police interaction when they arrive. Second, how she lets him know that I'm gonna call the cops on you and tell them that I am being attacked by a black man. She throws this in his face because she knows the benefit of saying what would happen if she is under attack, particularly by a black man. And three, how she claims that this is not a racist act. However, this is what many are calling reflective racism, internal, automatic, when certain elements of fear are raised. Now, I am not saying that we should not utilize public safety when we feel threatened. What I am saying is that weaponizing another person's race for personal benefit is inherently unjust. And that these are the situ situations in which black men end up dying at the hands of law enforcement over an incident. You have heard from our seasoned professionals. They, they've experienced with their systemic racism and personal interactions. I'm here also, and I have a long list of interactions, but I want to let you know too that being a homeowner does not immune you from also being called on while you're black. I've had the police call the cops on me multiple times. If it ranged from having my dog tied up to, to burning leaves that weren't burned to, to whatever it might be, I am George Floyd. My name is John Warren. Uh, I work at Northwest Suburban Integration School District, which is a uh, partnership with uh, many of, of, of the colleges in the state of Minnesota. I am George Floyd, and it's sad that we all have stories. And just like the brothers before me, I, I, I could have I, I could have my own uh, Zoom call with as many stories. But my story is based off of two miles away from my home in the city of Brooklyn Park. My daughter and I were coming home from a, a basketball camp that she was at, and I want to say that because of my daughter. I feel that I'm alive. I'm a light-skinned, mixed individual. Sometimes I can go underneath the radar and people not know. Majority of them are uninformed white folks that don't think of anything because they think everybody's white or black. Majority of people of color know, hey, he's about something, he is something. 
So as we were driving home, I saw a Brooklyn Park police officer eyeing me down to the point where I didn't understand how this man was driving while eyeing me down as much as he was. I will say that I was in a nice car. I will say that I was doing the speed limit because the second that you see a police officer, your heart starts beating through your chest and, 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 and all you're doing is thinking, what am I doing wrong? What am I doing wrong? What am I doing wrong? Not so much, I'm good. As I kept driving, I see him slowing down. I see him coming behind me. I see him putting his lights on and I pull over. Now, mind you, the last couple of weeks, I've been having issues with child support and their inaccuracies of saying that I've been paying or not paying. So in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, okay, what is this about? How is this gonna go down? And I hope I'm safe. And more importantly, I hope my daughter's safe. So as he comes and approaches the car, he asks me my name. And of course he asked me those famous words, is this your car? And of course, I know my name. I know that this is my car. And I give him the information that he asked for. So he comes back and he says, your license is suspended. Now, mind you, I had just gotten off the phone hours ago with folks that saying, you're good, you're good, and you're good. I thought it was over. I'm less than two miles away from my house. His hand goes on his gun. And he asked me nine times if I want to go to jail. Do you want to go to jail? Do you want to go to jail? Do you want to go to jail? He stops, goes to the other side of the car because he's looking. He's searching my car without being in my car. Now at this point, I am frustrated. I am terrified because my daughter's in the back seat. I'm trying to calm her down. And all he is saying is, do you want to go to jail? With his hand on his gun, he is waiting for me to make the wrong move. He is waiting for me to make any move that's gonna allow him to come after me and to do whatever it is that is in his mind. I was not speeding. I was not breaking the law. I was not swearing at him. I used all the words that we have been taught to use when dealing with the police. Yes, sir. No, sir. Of course. Yes. As my daughter cries in the back seat, and as frustrated tears start rolling down my face, I could do nothing but sit there and wait for him to decide what is gonna happen to me. I'm alive today. My daughter is alive today. And to this day, I still say that she is the reason that nothing happened to me on that moment. Again, I'm a mixed individual, I'm light skin, but that one drop rule is no joke. It is no joke. They tell me what I am. They don't ask me what I am. They tell me what I am with the actions. They tell me what I am with the experiences time and time and time again. I'm two miles away from my house. You can see it on my driver's license. But yet, I'm in the wrong. He had no clue who I was. He had no clue what to do, but yet, he was in charge and he let me know it. I am George Floyd. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Stephen Kent. I'm the Vice President of Finance and Facilities at North Hennepin Community College. I am George Floyd. 
I want to take a different spin. I have police stories. I have all these kind of same stories as my brothers. I want to just tell you a community story. I was in the military, young, about 23 years old, officer, driving to Walmart with my pregnant wife. And I saw a woman who, we saw a woman who's a, a white young lady who was obviously having car trouble. My wife looked at me and said, are you going to help her? I said, I know nothing about a car. And just her face looked disappointed. Because I want somebody to help you, I said, I'm going to ask her if she needs any help. I asked her, ma'am, I'm Lieutenant Kent. I'm in, military, I'm in a military uniform. How can I help you? You look like you're in distress. She said, this is the new used car for us. My husband took the old vehicle on home from Walmart, left us the new vehicle because the old vehicle didn't have any heat. It was wintertime, the middle, mid, the middle of winter. She said to me, I cannot find the lights to turn the car on. My husband must have nigger rigged it or something to get it to work. On the inside of me, I feel like she ripped my heart out. I said, to on the inside, what did you say to me? On the outside, I didn't flinch. I continued on, looked in the back seat of her car, it was just a little bitty infant baby um, strapped, strapped, in the, strapped in the car seat. And I'm thinking, this is what this child's growing up around. This is the language that this child will use because this is that child's norm. For three hours, I didn't speak to my wife or, or anything. I didn't talk because I was so outraged. And she said, what happened? I explained to her what happened. She apologized. All my friends said, they would have said, you know, cussed her out or whatever. And from that moment on, my racial antenna has always been alert. And for anyone who knows me, if you say something that's not right, or even if I don't understand it, like use a pronoun, I will call you on it, like who's we? Or I will call you on it. And uh, my, my lesson that I learned that I wish I had said then, that I'm always prepared to say now, is when somebody says something like that or would do something like that, I would just put it back on them intelligently and say, what do you mean by nigger rigged And then stop talking, just to bring it to light. So I would challenge you when you feel something or you hear something that's not right, make a stand. I am George Floyd. Breathe. Breathe, baby. Relax, Junior. My mother whispered to me as I woke from a nightmare crying and distraught. Although we didn't talk about that dream, but she understood as she rubbed my eight-year-old back. That night, before falling asleep, I had overheard my grandmother talking to my parents and aunts about the church across the street from my aunt's home and why they didn't build east of the old building. The tree on that large lot, which I had passed by several times, represented a lot of history and anguish and served as a reminder. I remember the tears running down my grandmother's eyes as she called each family member and friends by name who were lynched and hung from that very tree. That, that night, I dreamed that my uncles, my father, my brother, and myself lynched, hanging from that very tree. Breathe, baby. Relax, Junior. I remember what seemed so long ago, the most relaxing weekend I had in a while, only to have it snatched off floor. After 400 years, 
of communicating the devastating effect of racism, the anguish, and the oppression through songs, writings, protesting, leading workshops, training programs, projects that empower and uplift. We find ourselves in the space, no matter what we do, no matter what we accomplish. For many of us, and that we fear for our children, like our aunt ancestors, our lives, and that our family can be negatively changed by one interaction with law enforcement, by one bold truth that intimidates and offend the normative, or a simple response to microaggression. When even some who we thought were true allies quickly pathologize the fight to breathe, the movement to eradicate systems of racism and oppression of all forms. You're left tired, but not privileged enough to give up or allowed for a moment to forget. I hope moving forward and that we are truly committed to actions and that the normative society, the Minnesota state system, the state of Minnesota and its citizens are dedicated to true action, courageous action that dismantles systems of oppression that reinforce a history of white supremacy and hold itself together by continued acts of racism. Only continued actions, not simply things that look good or make you feel good, or words on a piece of paper, strategic plans that represent deficit thinking, or parody models that continue the history of victim blame, but actions that are meaningful, deeper, and inclusive will bring about healing. Breathe. We got work to do. I am George Ford. Hello, everybody. This is Nikhil. Uh, I will be talking what we can all do right now uh, f uh, to help uh, the current wave we are in and how to support it. Um, I will. I, I'm waiting for. I need to be able to. It's been dis. I have. I'm not able to share the screen right now. Um, okay. Let me pull it up. Then. Can you, Ka, can you let me share the screen? So uh, uh, as I said, I'm Nikhil. I'm actually one of the co-chairs of the Indigenous Men and Men of Color. Um, I, as a non-Black POC, I will be talking about some strategies and I'll be talking some actions that we can take right today and tomorrow to start our, our fight against injustice. Uh, I have a list of items anywhere from going what we can do um, day to day basis to uh, to as a long term purpose. Uh, for example, the first and foremost I would like to talk about is um, I know protesting, it could be hard for everybody, but something I would like to say if you can, uh, if you're, it's possible for you, then I would definitely support it because everybody have responsibilities. So before you and me kick off, I just wanted to share this uh, piece that I found online. It talks about resistant is not one lane highway. Your, maybe your lane is protesting, maybe your lane in organizing, maybe your lane is counseling, maybe your lane is art activism, maybe your lane isn't surviving the day. Do not feel guilty for occupying every lane. We all need them. This goes out to every, uh, person of color, white ally, people who wants to uh, fight in the, along with us in this injustice, is this is, don't feel guilty you can do one or the other. We all have our different roles we play against this uh, systematic uh, oppression. 
Okay. So the first thing we can do is make a donation. There is actually a donation happening for George Floyd GoFundMe. That is money directly goes to George Floyd family for his burial, for counseling services, for his kids and for his community. I did not mention in this, there's also a GoFundMe for Mr. Aubrey who was shot in Atlanta. There's also fund for him. So if you want to go donate a couple dollars, that'll be great. And also um, you can also donate to Minnesota, Minnesota Freedom Fund. This is a fund that actually helps uh, to uh, bail out protesters who have been jailed. And especially if you all know how the current conditions in the jail and the government facilities are no longer safe for our people. So if you could please uh, donate a couple of uh, dollars, that'll be great. And the Black Vision Collective um, is also um, is also uh, queer, black, uh, uh, inclusive leaders. Those are the leaders who are running actually most of the silent protest at the Capitol right now. Uh, then two, you can also do is uh, food and uh, supplies drive. Uh, there are a couple of nonprofits you can uh, take, uh, put a poster upon us. And one of the most important one that I personally am connected with the second one, Papa Food Pantries. That's a grassroots level organization that bunch of organizers and uh, community uh, leaders came together and are, are collecting food and providing them. They're open today, daily from 11 to four. And I also uh, like to encourage you all to go and volunteer there. Uh, sign a petition. This is the easiest thing you can do right now. The first thing is reclaim the block. It is an organization that's calling on the Minneapolis city council to become a visionary leaders by defunding public, uh, public uh, police department and invest the resources to keep the black communities, indigenous communities, communities of color safe. And also a uh, change of colors and other petition that's going around, that's very important. Uh, Justice for George Floyd, that's the one that has over 8.5 8 million supporters. We need more uh, signatures on it. If you can attend uh, and sorry, if you can sign the petition, that'll be great. And then also we have the one that's going on for quite a while is National uh, Action Against Police Brutality. You can find that on change.org. If you ever, ever seen any police brutality and fed up and didn't know what to do, this is the easiest thing you can do from your home. And the last thing is volunteering. Uh, again, I, as I mentioned, the pop-up food pantry needs a lot of volunteers other than food. They need people to distribute food because people are coming there and they need help. And the cleaning efforts, last weekend in Minneapolis at Lake Street, a lot of uh, young and um, protesters and activists were there actually cleaning up the aftermath of what has happened. And the best thing I would say is how to volunteer is to be an ally. If you're white and if you're non-black POC, I would say use your knowledge to fight the anti-black narrative that's in our community. This also involves reading and exploring our own role and how we support Black Lives Matter. For me, the biggest disappointment was to see my personal friends and families have some anti-Black narrative. And I realized that's my space to step up and advocate for my uh, uh, Black friends. So that's, and I also see a lot of uh, online um, solidarity that needs to come out from the original Black Lives Movement to the blackout that you probably saw yesterday. It, all the online campaignings are huge. If you ever see an online, somebody's uh, cyberbullying or talking that is not helpful towards the black community, I usually, again, depending upon the relationship, I did this to my brother-in-law who was had a very anti-black narrative. I had to like private message him and said, hey, can we talk about this? And this is where we need our allies. This is where non-black POCs and white allies can come in to help our black community. Uh, and then the most important part you can do right now uh, interrupting uh, institutional racism is this right here. You are here, you are part of this webinar. Take this, uh, make sure your campus get involved in, uh, on indigenous and men of color. If you have people, send them to our work group and then also have affinity uh, groups on your campus. We at North Tampa Community College, we have two affinity groups. We have one people of color affinity group and queer, people, uh, queer uh, affinity group. So ask your HR whether you can have a affinity group so that the people of color and people who are non-dominant identity can have a sense of belonging on campus and get clued up about the anti-racist struggle. Nowadays, we all talk about how not to be racist. I think we have to be anti-racist. We have to actually ask ourselves how we have to eradicate racism. Uh, I would say keep listening and keep reading, especially if you're white and you come from a non-dominant space, I would actually request you to please listen before condoning uh, the actions of uh, especially what's happening right now. And to ensure the uh, progress of POIC-wise at a table and the part of decision, 
this is also important. Again, if you're having a search committee on your campus, please see if you have a, a non-dominant group voices represented in your search committee. Uh, the other thing is support black creators and black business owners, specifically descendants of enslaved Africans. Uh, there are a lot of online uh, activism going on through black community. There's a lot of great art you can find. Make sure you support black business and black creators. Uh, and when the demonstra uh, uh, demonstration ends, you and at the end of the time, I would say, just be engaged with people and also learn where you can stand in. And most importantly for us, nothing for us without us is for us. All right, I'm Michael Bouchard. I, I work at Inver Hills Community College and Dakota County Technical College. Um, I've been a part of this group for quite some time. And I just thought I would share with everybody. Um, and at the end of this platform, we'll be have, we, we save time so we could do uh, question and answer. So if you want to start putting any questions in the question and answer area, uh, we'll use those and we'll give um, opportunities for the panelists to answer those questions. Uh, so the indigenous men and men of color, uh, we have a platform and we're going to have a poll at the end of this platform as well um, around the platform itself. Uh, but so we have some things that we want to be working towards. Um, one of the first things is, is that we want to see an immediate end of police brutality and murder of black, brown, Asian, and indigenous people. And this includes, in terms of Minnesota State, an immediate, an immediate review of all the trainings Minnesota State provides law enforcement agencies. And it also includes uh, that Minnesota State, in consultation with the indigenous men and men of color work group, content experts, faculty and administration, that we review and make significant changes to the academic and skills requirements to earn a law enforcement or criminal justice degree certificate or continue in education units within Minnesota State. And we just want to reinforce that at this moment and at this time um, that black lives do matter uh, and we recognize the importance of that, of saying that out loud. We want racial equity within Minnesota State and this includes uh, to increase the curriculum at each campus that is representative of people of color and indigenous cultures and have all Minnesota State College and universities require all undergraduate students to complete an approved learning experience, at least three credits with significant focus on race and racism to graduate from the, from the institution. In all possible cases, these courses are to be taught by teachers from our communities. Uh, and then implement and deploy the Minnesota State Equity 2030 strategic initiatives to eliminate the educational equity, equity gaps at every Minnesota State College and University. When it comes to human resources, we want racial equity within Minnesota State. And this includes at least five mandatory cultural literacy training hours for all employees in Minnesota State each academic year. An overhaul of Minnesota State employment process that hire faculty reflective of the student body that we serve. And the removal of the word chief from all job titles in Minnesota State and Minnesota State's chief diversity officer title changed to vice chancellor of equity and inclusion. In finance and facilities, we want racial equity within Minnesota State. And this includes our campus design to include and honor the diverse communities in which, in which we serve. This includes artwork, architecture, paint choices, et cetera. A stronger commitment from our institutions on the dollars spent and tracked in communities of color and indigenous communities and provide employee, cultural, and or racial affinity working groups additional resources, uh, uh, access addition, working groups additional access to resources and funding to support our work to end inequity in our college campuses, and a greater commitment to hold campuses accountable on how they spend their own access and opportunity funds. And like Audre Lorde had said, when we speak, we are afraid of our words. When we speak, we are afraid our words will not be heard or welcomed. But when we are silent, we are still afraid. So it is better to speak. So today, this has been your call to action. And we're asking you, each one of you, to commit to this work and to support the initiatives that make a difference. This group has been around for quite a few years now. Uh, but we haven't necessarily been that noticed. We were tired of that. And we said we need to make sure our voices are heard. 
If you want to learn more about the Minnesota State Indigenous Men and Men of Color Work Group, you can email our co-chairs who are both with us on this webinar right now, Jeremy Clark and Nikhil Angola. We're now open uh, for question and answers. And one of the questions, um, I'm gonna end, I'm gonna stop sharing uh, the screen, but one of the questions is, I'm a white instructor within the Minn State system that teaches a course called Multicultural Awareness. As a student of the 70s, and as an instructor of multicultural awareness for almost 30 years, I feel tired and hopeless. I'm wondering if somebody in our group would like to answer that. Kent, I'm calling on you. Michael, can you read the question again? I really like, I'm tired and hopeless. We're all tired and hopeless. I didn't hear that question again. I'm gonna go back up. I'm a white instructor within the system and he teaches a course called Multicultural Awareness. As a student of the 70s and as an instructor of multicultural awareness for almost 30 years, I feel tired and I feel hopeless. Welcome to the, welcome to the, welcome to the party. Yes, um, and I, I, I would just add to that. We need you now um, more than ever to, to continue the, the fight. Um, <clears throat> one, of, one of the primary things that, that students, my, my students that were reaching out to me um, over the past couple of days, they're tired as well. Um, some, some are 16, 17 years old, and they're tired from things that they've seen. Um, that, that was the overwhelming feeling I had. That story, I've heard it. I've heard it every week. I, I hear it monthly. I experienced it myself. Every day I wake up tired. I, I can't hide my blackness. So every day I walk out there, the, the microaggressions I see, everything, it, the, the, tire, the tiredness turns into motivation to let me know that I still have work to do and I still need, need to keep pushing. Michael, I wanna say one more thing about that. Mo A lot of us on this webinar may be parents and whether you're a white parent, black parent, doesn't matter, a parent can get this. You fear for your children's safety. When they, they go out on drive in their car, when they first learn to drive, you have a certain kind of protection that you have for them. Well, my sons, being black boys, 22, 27 years old, they think they're invincible. So they're outraged about what's going on in the world today and, and they want to solve the problem through violence, through rage, with the only thing they know how to do as far as, you know, be angry. And as a black dad, I mean, that could be me on the ground. That could be my son on the ground. And I'm just like, son, rage is not going to answer it. Yes, I know you're upset, but I need you to not act like you feel because your mom and I may be putting flowers on your grave. It's just a different level of concern for your children when you're a black man. It just is. And I think the thing to do now is act. I saw a question in the chat room about us making these resources that Nikhil talked about available to everyone. And I think, Michael, Kyle, if we can take what we're doing and put that into a link so people can click on the link and get to what Nikhil has said to, for you know, how they can act, make it simple for them, or like the poll that Jeremy, that um, Ken. Harper put together, will you support us, blah, 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 blah. Make it simple for people to- All, all of this will be mailed, all of this will be sent out, included the webinar and all of the resources, uh, and including Dr. Tripp's uh, latest essay uh, that he has written about the George Floyd murder, uh, will all be included in an email that we'll send out so that everybody within Minnesota State will be able to have access. And we can link those things to when they kill the resources. That's right, including the PowerPoint. Yep. Yep. Thank you. Yep. I'm gonna, I'm um, in. Go ahead, please, Dr. Tripp. Okay. Um, now, all of us who have been actively in the struggle experience feelings of exhaustion. Right? Sometimes, uh, and it, and and unless you step back 
and get a broader understanding of how the world works, how society works, and who you are, and how you can stay healthy mentally and physically. And I want to emphasize right now that a lot of people let go on the physical aspect. What do you need to do to keep yourself physical, physically healthy? And so you have to think about, you have to change eating habits. You have to pay attention to uh, sleep. You have to pay attention to exercise. Because one thing you realize, if you really think deeply about things, is that in order for you to be effective in anything, you have to, have, you have to be healthy. If you're sick and fired, you're just like the pandemic and all people who are, if you're bedridden, what can you do? You be, as a matter of fact, somebody has to take care of you. So uh, we have to take care of our body. We have to take care of our science. And then we have to get back into the battle. I mean, it's just like in boxing. Uh, they have, you know why they have intermixtures? They say, okay, the guys go out there and box for about, uh, about three minutes and then they take a two minute rest and three minutes and all that. When you study, you have to put forth and then you have to take a rest. Your body has to get back and has to reestablish itself so it can go another round. So uh, many times uh, activists, you would, you would think that they are, they are doctors on call or they're part of the fire department. Yeah, no, you have to first uh, discipline yourself, and then make judgments about what things you can handle, what things you have the ability to address, and what things you do not. For instance, uh, the way I can help, I don't have legal training. So the point here is that maybe I can uh, direct you to somebody who uh, is qualified and can provide those services. But a lot of times, if you want to avoid a burnout, recognize your limitations. We all have limitations, and a lot of times, sometimes we have to do a psychological adjustment because a lot of many times, if we don't respond, then we may experience, have feelings of guilt, no. So the point here is that when you recognize your limitations and you begin to con have more control on your response and be a, a long distance fighter, right? Not the little short fighter, a long distance fighter. So one of the keys, you know, I'm 79 years old, and I've been in the battle, battle for since I was 19, okay? And you know that this fight is an ongoing fight. It is not gonna end. Human beings are flawed. In your, in the struggles, you're gonna find uh, wonderful people, love people. At the same time, you find hateful people. That hate is always gonna be there. There's not gonna be a complete eradication of racism or sexism or any of this other stuff. You just have to decide you're gonna take a stand and what, and in the struggle, what's gonna be your role? So we're born into the struggle and we're gonna die, you know, when we pass out and the struggle will still continue. So the point here is that you're not struggling for a utopia, you're not, because that's unrealistic, because it's unrealistic. You say that this is the kind of, this is my vision of the kind of world I wanna live in and I'm, not, and I'm gonna fight for it, right? And so you just have to understand that dynamic, but it's never going to be this, uh, uh, this utopia, right? But it just serves as a direction for your struggle. But in the meantime, uh, you have to say, to make a, a, a maximize your contribution, you better maximize your state of health. Thank you, Dr. Tripp. This one here I'll, I'll present to uh, John and John. Uh, speaking as a male educator, can you share something that all educators can do in their classrooms to promote culturally responsive teaching? Acknowledge your privilege and recognize it for what it is. It is privilege, the ability to not have to worry if you're going to make it home to your children or if, or if you have children and you're an educator, not having to worry um, about something bad happening to them. Uh, students experience a ton of different things on our Minnesota State Colleges and University campuses. And ideally, I mean, unless you're a person of color, you may not be aware of them. I would actually charge um, other educators and faculty 
to re-examine their curriculum and re-examine to see if it's equitable. Is it inclusive? Is it diverse? Now, I know that may be hard to do in the natural sciences and in other areas that our uh, faculty teach. And that's not to say that they aren't being diverse and they aren't being equitive and they aren't being inclusive, but I challenge you to be creative. You know, it, it's one thing to call one of us or somebody of color that you know to come in and speak to a, a classroom. That's all well and good. This is a heart issue. It has to be retained. It has to affect the heart, mind, body, and soul. And so if you're looking for a way to do that, start looking at policy, start looking at curriculum, start looking at the immediate ways you can affect change within your sphere of influence. Because if you're able to reach one, you're able to reach many. John. Yeah, definitely. That uh, Brother Harper's got it, got it right on. I mean, um, but I, I will add to that to say, see your students, see them see them, see them, um, and also do the work. Because a lot of times math, sciences, and, and, and other uh, non-social uh, avenues kind of get looked over to say, well, there's nothing that we can do. That's not true. Look at the angle that you are teaching from. Look at the pieces that you are pushing in your classrooms. Look at the angles that you see, that you talk about, the vocabulary that you're using, and also do the work. Do the work on yourself. Do the work on yourself because I guarantee you that that is coming out in your classrooms, in the hallways, in every kind of meeting that you are in. There, there was a request for us to share the Minnesota State Vendors roster and uh, Robert Harper, uh, who uh, supports this effort within the Minnesota State system will help us um, uh, make sure that that list is sent out with our um, with our information, with our with our webinar, um, one of the questions is is about um, how, as an institution that is predominantly has a majority of student, a lot of students of color, but very few employees of color. Is there any strategies or tips that you would have in terms of um, reaching out to make sure that we get more applicants of color? Um, would anybody like to 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 say anything on that? I would say work with your human resources and figure out where they are putting the, the posts. Um, there's the Minnesota State, not, not Minnesota State, but there's a people of color career fair um, that happens twice a year. It's normally in October and April, um, but it's a career fair um, that, that is designed specifically to attract um, applicants of color. Um, it's one of the largest ones in the state um, and you could even Google um, POC Career Fair Minnesota, and it could bring up some resources for you. But I would say work with your HR to ask those questions to see where the positions are being posted. And if you know colleagues within your network that are qualified and that are of color to start sending um, these jobs and opportunities within there. So just expand where, wherever they, they have been posting is a tip I would offer. There, there is uh, the National Registry uh, that people can engage in. Another important thing is make sure that your colleges are a part of the community. Uh, get engaged with community-based organizations that serve uh, historically underserved populations and uh, make sure that you're giving your job postings within those communities as well. Uh, there is affinity groups within every discipline. Um, for example, um, I'm making things up. Uh, the Black Psychologists of America Association. Make sure that with it, if it's in that discipline that we're, we're reaching out, work with the faculty members. Don't make sure that it's not just HR's responsibility, but that it's all of our responsibility to make sure that we're sharing postings, uh, especially in protected class groups. Nikhil. And, and I'll also say start nurturing the youth right now that are in your class to become the teacher. I have, uh, I'm gonna pick up on one of my students. Uh, the student identifies a native student. And um, I have to, you know, ask him, do you, would you ever want to teach Native studies? You know, sometimes you have to put that thought in their head. Sometimes you have to nurture them. They may not, but there is a significant lack of people of color in certain fields. And there's no people. I have sat on the search committees for years now. Something there's no, that the, what you do sometimes is you nurture. You nurture from ground up. You talk to students and because some of the students don't even have opportunity to see themselves in those roles because the system never led them to see themselves in those great positions, you know? 
So that's what I, as a multicultural coordinator on my campus, we do is with our students of color is give them that variety of experience. Would you like to teach? Would you like to be a, a community organizer? You know? So yeah, that's all I have. Um, I think Jesse was going to say something, but Jesse, I have another question for you as well after this. Okay. Well, what I would add with Dr. Pickett um, put in the chat and what's been said as well, is there are two things that we often forget when we do the position description, is it inclusive? Um, is it inviting um, to individuals? And also, not only, as Dr. Pickett said, develop um, our faculty and staff and employees within the institution, but we have to prepare the institution um, as a whole um, in the communities that we work in as a whole to be accepting um, of this. Because if you've looked at the data for a lot of um, individuals of a color who come here in an average of two or three years that they stay before they turn around, what about what is it about? It's not only just the business that has to change or their employee, employers, and the employees, but the communities as well. So we have to think about it as a holistic approach when we're inviting individuals here. Thank you. Now, this, was, this next question is for David Isham and for uh, Jesse Mason. Fighting racism goes hand in hand with creating communities uh, where everyone has a voice and a chance to work together. In your years of working in the educational institutions uh, to create positive change, could you share some lessons learned for advancing racial equity and holding the executive leadership accountable. David, would you start? Well, I'll try my best, but uh, we are still trying to figure out Indian education. Indian education emerged out of the, out of the uh, civil rights movement of the 60s. Uh, we have a system that's out here that we are all part of, each and every one of us here. And that is a system that was designed years and years and years ago, years before Eve, any of us even took our first breath. It's a system set up by Caucasian males for Caucasian males. Since then, we have been evolving into something that, to be a little bit more inclusive. Women's studies, Native studies, African-American studies, you name it. We have all these components that we are trying to make fit into a, a system that uh, was not designed specifically for that nature. Uh, over the years, we're seeing more and more uh, things added on and, and uh, requirements for, for degrees earned. Uh, from a Native perspective, we have a system that seems to fit more closely with the intent, which is to assimilate into predominant society. But from a Native perspective, the more we move in that direction, the less connection we have with who we are as Native people. We don't have a whole lot within the system that helps us as Native people understand who we are as Native people. Uh, we can barely pull together enough people to have an interest in things that are important to us as Native people. Language, culture, spirituality, you name it. Uh, all these are, are marginalized. Uh, we have not focused on them. Uh, we are looking to try to change that. We are also looking at uh, even the dialogue that we have out, 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 out there in the general public. As some of you have recently uh, witnessed, uh, when we had the peaceful protest that ended up on the uh, 35W bridge this past weekend, uh, out of nowhere came this truck. Boom, you know, there it was. Uh, whatever reason it, it happened, uh, it could have been a lot worse than it was, but it was still uh, significant. I watched it develop on one of the channel, local channels, and watched it codify itself into, into what it was. It was a, an accident. It, it never should have happened, but it did. Uh, I also saw people protecting that driver, which is what we should do. But at the same time, I also took the liberty of switching over to another news channel. And when I made that switch, the first thing I saw on the bottom of the of the screen, they were focusing on the on the, uh, the get together that was that was in St. Paul. So they had to quickly put something on the screen. And what they put on the screen was the the protest on 35W turned violent. And through my lens, I did not see that. I saw that there was some disturbance. I saw that there was a ruckus, but it did not turn violent. But the terminology we used kind of magnified it. You know, wanting people to Wow, what's happening going on? Uh, what's happening on 35W? 
and people would, would, would uh, uh, focus their change on that. But this is to illustrate the, the, the thread of languages that we use. We, I myself, as a native person sitting down in a classroom, I can remember as a young age, uh, talking about native people and the curriculum that we do have established already. Uh, the US soldiers won, it was a great victory. If the natives won, it was a massacre. But that terminology kind of permeates within you and that's what you grow up with. These are the things that we have to watch as we are in front of those students in the classroom. One of the things that I've been actively involved with is uh, finding more native teachers that will that have an interest in teaching. Now, the problem with that is we have native interest in teaching, but we're teaching the same old, same old curriculum. We're going to end up with the same old result unless we start ingraining in that some of the things that are important to us in, in this case for, for each individual, but for me in particular is native uh, influence, native uh, structure. I, today, the, the, the prayer I started with, I had to research and, and come up with the, the correct words that were used in Ojibwe to describe that. That should be secondary to me. As a native man, that should be secondary. You know, uh, my Ojibwe language is not my first language. So I use this, if I had to do the research to develop this so I could share this today. We don't, I mean, the system that we are looking at is, was intent on, on taking things away from native people, the boarding schools. I mean, it's a horrendous thing that happened to us as native people. And since then, we have not done anything to get us back to the point that we need to be as native people. We need this to, this is our homeland. And I walk outside the, my, my, my house, this is native land. This is Dakota land that we are on. And we don't emulate that enough. I mean, this, I mean, it, it's all secondary. I mean, you can, it, it, we're not doing the best job we can. There's room for an improvement. And I think we all have integral, integral parts in that. So I placed before you the challenge of what can we do as individuals to make this a better place for our children and our grandchildren and our grandchildren and grandchildren. So it's out there. This is it. We don't get a, you know, this is our world. This is it. Let's make it a better place. Justin, do you have anything you'd like to add? And, and just um, quickly, as Dr. Tripp mentioned earlier, um, we are all caught up, in, especially if you go into higher education, there is this force to uh, thrust you into conform or what we would, I would say, assimilate. That means giving part of your culture up in order to fit in and in order to hold things, um, people um, accountable, whether it's executives or faculty or any employee, we have to dismantle the process by which we make decisions and recognize that diversity, diversity comes in a number of different ways, but as my grandmother would say, and I hear it all the time, all skin folks ain't kin folks, and that there are some of us who look like me, who conform to um, the system and feel that they are rewarded for the system and have no problem with the continued alienation of others. So if, you, if you're at a policy table and you're creating policy, look around the table and recognize who's at and before you move forward. When you're hiring an executive member, Jesse, I think you're breaking up. Or administrator, look at strategic plan or anything about on campus, or just topical. I'm sorry. If it's just topical, then we're not doing anything. And people won't be hired. Thank you, Jesse. Jared? Uh, we had this, and this will, well, I would like to see a few of us answer this question, and, there's, and we're, we're starting to run short on time. We'll try to get to some of the other questions. Um, we didn't necessarily expect to have over a thousand people as part of our webinar, um, and it's hard to get to all of the questions. Um, what is your advice to approach conversations so that people don't feel attacked, especially in regard to white defensiveness and white fragility, uh, also within non-Black Indigenous POCs? Do we have a responsibility to make, uh, to take these feelings into account? And at what point do we continue these attempts if the other is unwilling to be open to black and indigenous experiences? Jared, would you like uh, to start? Well, 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 thank you for the question. Um, I'll share a strategy. Uh, if, if you're going to facilitate a conversation, 
and you're going to talk about cultural competency or, or racial discrimination, systemic injustice, it's first imperative to build a baseline of understanding. You need to get everybody on the same page. So this may be talking about everybody articulating a shared experience around feeling happy or feeling afraid um, and then moving in. Um, but in order to just jump right into the topic off top, it's not gonna be as effective unless you establish a baseline of feelings within the group. And I, I would say before you, you start, it's imperative that you establish ground rules to let them know that Yes, we, we could have difference of opinions, um, but but long as it's grounded and everybody respects each other, um, make, making sure it's grounded that way. Um, and, and know that no resolution or no agreement might come at the end of the conversation. Um, you, you both could still leave with differing viewpoints and things like that. You, you can't force somebody um, to come, come to the table. Um, hopefully they'll, they'll come when they are ready. So I would say make sure it's grounded. Others, John, Chung. Um, I, I'm, I'm a little bit different. I 100% uh, concur and agree uh, with the other panelists and what's already been said, but I'm also a little different in that um, I don't like to let things linger. I believe sometimes the best way to tackle a potential problem or issue is to tackle it right head on. Uh, yes, you should have tact, there should be a ton of understanding with that. Uh, but sometimes you got to call a spade a spade and call it for exactly what it is. If there's an issue we can collectively uproot together, we're definitely going to need to do that. And these are conversations that, in all honesty, they're not supposed to feel good. They're, they're, they're not supposed to feel good. These are hard times. They've been hard times for as many years. Um, as this country has been in existence, right? And so you need to get to the root of the issue. Don't beat around the bush, At attack the issue. Don't attack the person. Attack the issue, don't attack the person. You know, um, George Floyd was actually murdered in my neighborhood. So for me, this hits a little different. And so I've had to shift my mind and my focus to not just being about action, not just wanting to have these courageous conversations, but getting down to the root of what the problem is uh, within our institutions and within the individual. And there may be things that, you know, that are said that, yes, they absolutely may hurt feelings, but I'd rather have your feelings hurt and we make progress so then you can go forth and help other people that were in the same situation like you make progress than to just cover it up, put a Band-Aid on it, and then us have to go back and put another Band-Aid on it a week from now or a year from now, if that makes sense. I, I agree with uh, all the uh, other panelists' uh, answers, but to just kind of go back to what Nikhil said, you know, especially uh, as a person, uh, a person of color who's not black, um, we need to tackle it within our community. I see it all the time. I hear it all the time. And we need to be able to say, you know, hey, that's wrong, or that's, let, let's talk about it. You know, let's talk about it. Like uh, John said, you don't want to attack the person, but you want to get down to the root of the issue you know, and get it across. And sometimes you just can't, you know, some people will just not change, but at least, you know, you're getting down to it. You're having that talk. So. Thank you, Chung. I think, um, you know, here's the results of our poll. 92% uh, of the people support our platform. Uh, only 8% aren't sure and 0% said no. I think we're on to something. And I couldn't find a better group of men that I would like to be on this journey with than the group that I'm here with today. So I appreciate you all. Uh, and I'm going to turn this over to Nikhil and to Jeremy to close us out. Thank you. Um, Go ahead, John. Go ahead, John. Go ahead. <clears throat> um, and just wanted to thank you all for, um, if, if, if it is your first step, um, thank you for, for listening and, and hearing um, with us here. Um, I would challenge you all to let's, let's continue this conversation. We're going to need, we're going to have to work collaboratively to fix something so large. Um, I appreciate all of you and, and thank you for, for coming. Yeah. Go ahead, uh, sorry. You're good. 
as a co-chair person for Indigenous and Men of Color, I want to say thank you, all of y'all to be here. Um, we will put our email addresses in chat room. I got a lot of questions. How do we join? How do we get connected? I couldn't respond to each one of you individually. So we'll put me, mine and Jeremy's uh, email address in the chat box. And plus, um, the different ways. And as Jeremy said, we all in this together. We need each each other to break the system. So thank you. Yes, and we we have been around. Um, typically, we meet the third Friday of every month. Um, you can email Nikhil or myself if you all want to join and and attend. Um, but yes, um, we 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 have been around. Um, we the the more participation we can get, the more change we can effectively have. So um, let let's all come together and let's not um, lose this momentum of almost a thousand folks here today. Go ahead, Kent. I'm sorry. Sure. Um, I think we'll be remiss if we didn't acknowledge Dr. Clyde Pickett, uh, who is the system office. Uh, Lead Diversity Officer, uh, Vice Chancellor Clyde Pickett to be named if we get, if we get it our way. Uh, he's done a lot for the Indigenous Men, Men of Color work group. And he's the chief, not chief, he's the, the lead. Um, he's one of the lead people in the, in, in the system trying to advocate on behalf of uh, men of color. And I think it's um, wise to yield a minute or two to Dr. Pickett, if he, if he chooses to say anything. Well, I want to be respectful of our colleagues' time, and certainly um, I don't, I'll be short. I express my appreciation for you all for organizing and for being part of this as we step up and think about our solutions. Uh -huh. Our colleagues who have taken the opportunity to join and have asked a number of questions, I want to encourage them to keep the dialogue going. Uh, we certainly know that not all of our questions were answered here uh, and that there are opportunities for us to expand. I know some of the questions asked about other groups uh, and there exists a space for us to think about representation across the spectrum and how we move and advance change. So I do want to acknowledge that that is a part of our work. But this is about George Floyd today. Uh, it is about black men today and it is about the push for justice. So in all that we do, I leave you with questioning your own responsibility and opportunities to impact change and how we think about our responsibility to be involved, not only on our campuses, uh, but in our communities as we think about what our experiences are, but what they should be. So thank you all for uh, giving me just a minute to speak and thank you for all the work that you're doing for our colleagues, the work that you continue to do. We are in this together. Thank you. Ka, could you mute everybody but the panelists? We good? All right, so Jeremy and I, get, are we good, Ka? We are good. Okay, uh, Jeremy and I got to head off. We have a one o'clock uh, webinar on our campus that as a follow-up to this conversation. It'd be great if we could catch up um, a little bit later uh, maybe this afternoon or something, if anybody's free, just to recap.